In order to find the hydrostatic force on one end of this trough, we want to split the problem up into two phases. Let's examine phase one, and during this phase we have to calculate the force that is being exerted on a very thin rectangular strip. Now, we have gone to an arbitrary depth within the fluid, and we have drawn a thin rectangular strip right there. We've labeled the dimension across, basically the width of the strip, as W sub I. This dimension here is very, very thin. It's a very tiny distance, and usually we ascribe a delta x to represent a very tiny distance in calculus. And again, we have to calculate the force that is acting on that strip. Now, we know that the force is going to equal the pressure at that location multiplied by the area of that thin rectangular strip. We probably have also learned that the pressure can be expressed as the density of the fluid times the gravitational constant g times the depth at which that thin rectangular strip is located. So this will be multiplied again by the area. Now let's talk about that depth. We have drawn a vertical scale here. We have arbitrarily chosen the reference point of zero at the bottom of the trough. And then the upper section of the trough would actually be located at four radical three, but let's understand that. So remember that the dimension here was eight, and then if we were to basically split this in half, then this dimension here would be four. So this vertical dotted line can be figured out using just Pythagorean theorem. So if this is eight, this is four. We'll just call this h for now, and we can see that h squared plus four squared would equal eight squared. So then eight squared plus 16 equals 64, h squared would equal 48 if you subtract 16 from both sides there, and then square root, you get radical 48, and of course we can rewrite that as radical 16 times radical 3. The square root of 16 is 4, so we definitely get 4 radical 3 for the entire height of this isosceles triangle. And then what we've done is at the location of that thin rectangular strip, we have arbitrarily given it a designation of x sub i star. Just a fancy symbol to show us that that would be the location of our thin rectangular strip. We got to figure out the depth below the surface. Now, the depth below the surface would be this little dimension right here, because you know here's the top of the surface and then the strip is down here, so the depth would be that vertical distance right there. And we can see from the scale that since from here to here is the xi star, and from here to here is four radical three, then this dimension right here would have to be the longer segment of four radical three minus the shorter segment of x sub i star. So in other words, for the depth, that little d in the equation, we're going to have the four radical three minus the x sub i star. So far, so good. Now, let's turn to the area. Area of a rectangle, is just, you know, it's width times its length. The width is wi, and then the length is very teeny tiny. It's just delta x. Why don't we just, you know, we're going to multiply by delta x, but we'll just offset it over here for now. So we're doing a great job right now, but the problem is we have w sub i, and we need that expressed in terms of x. You know, that way we just have a single variable. We would have x here, x there. We need the w sub i also expressed in terms of x. So that becomes our next goal. And to do that, we're going to have to examine some similar isosceles triangles. I think I've been saying they're isosceles, but in fact they were equilateral. I suppose that's not a big deal, but let's draw the larger equilateral triangle. And we know that that has a dimension across its base of eight. We determined that this was four radical three. Then we have a smaller triangle right here. We'll just draw that and that has a dimension labeled w sub i here. And then this length right here would just be this dimension along our scale. So that's just the x i star. So what's nice is we can set up a proportion to express w sub i in terms of x. So it's just a basic proportion. We could say w sub i is to eight as x i star is to four radical three. And then we will, mul whoa, that's a weird three. We will multiply both sides of the equation by eight. So now we have w sub i is equal to eight x sub i star over four radical three. 
And we can reduce by dividing numerator and denominator by four. So we get two x sub i star over radical three. That's awesome. Now we have w sub i in terms of x. So we'll fill it in right there. And now we finally have completed phase one of the problem. We have the force acting on this thin rectangular strip. And it is all expressed in terms of a single variable x. And don't forget the little delta x there. Okay, so phase one is complete. We move on to phase two. Let's remind ourselves of what that was. Phase two was to integrate across the entire surface. So basically what's happening here is, well, it's the power of calculus. You're going to be taking not just one thin rectangular strip, but technically an infinite number of them. So you can imagine all sorts of thin rectangular strips along the trough's surface here. And integration allows us to add all of the forces that are acting on each individual one of the infinite number of strips. It's uh, pretty much a wild idea. So in phase two here, we're going to say that the total force is an integral, and then we're going to write our expression. But everywhere we have that little x sub i star, we can change that to just a variable x. So it begins to look like a standard integral. Also, the delta x becomes dx notation. As for the bounds, you're integrating vertically up the trough, so you're going from zero to four radical three for your lower and upper bounds respectively. So zero, whoa, that is not looking good as a zero. Zero to four radical three. Okie dokie, why don't we, hmm, why don't we factor out some constants? You have rho g, you have two, and you have radical three. So if we factor those out, you would have two rho g over radical three times the integral from zero to four radical three. And why don't we also just distribute that x? If you distribute that, you'll get four radical three x minus x squared. This is a nice, easy integral. Because when we integrate, we're going to get four radical three x to the power of two over two minus x to the power of three over three, evaluated from zero to four radical three. Now, you can simplify a little bit. I guess four divided by two is just two. So we can actually just clean that up, make that a two. We'll plug in the upper bound first, of course. So two rho g over radical three. We're going to have two radical three times four radical three squared minus, goodness, four radical three cubed over three. That's the upper bound. Luckily, the lower bound is zero. So when you plug zero into those x's, they just zero out. So you're going to end up subtracting nothing there. So that simplifies our lives slightly. Let's go ahead and square the four radical three. So you're going to have 16 radical nine which is 16 times three, which is 48. And then over here, four radical three cubed. That's fun, isn't it? So four radical three, that's the same thing as four radical three squared times another four radical three. Now four radical three was just 16 times three, which is 48. 48 times four is 192. So this is getting rather messy, isn't it? So it's two rho g over radical three. Why don't we also do this? 48 times two is 96. So 96 radical three minus, goodness, we had 16 times three times four. So that's 192 radical three over three. We'll find a common denominator next. We'll multiply this by three and then multiply upstairs by three and 96 times three is 288. 288 minus 192 is 96. So inside here, you're gonna have 96 radical three over three. Outside you have two rho g over radical three. It's getting simpler now. The radical threes cancel. You could do two times 96 divided by three and you're gonna get 64, thank goodness. So you get 64 times the density times G. Recall that the density given in the question was 840. So we can actually go in and plug in 840 times 9.8, which is the value for G. And we finally have an answer here. It's going to be 50, no, 526,848. This will be in Newtons. And that is the total force acting on the side of that trough.